Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family, Jake and Kim and a special welcome back to Barbara and Ray. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and learning more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else. You'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's relax with more from one of the Western world's first historians and read more from an account of Egypt by Herodotus, translated in 1890 by George Campbell Macaulay. Let's begin. There are about Thebes sacred serpents, not at all harmful to men, which are small in size and have two horns growing from the top of the head. These they bury when they die in the temple of Zeus, for to this god they say they are sacred. There is a region, moreover, in Arabia, situated nearly over against the city of Buto, to which place I came to inquire about the winged serpents. And when I came thither, I saw bones of serpents and spines in quantity so great that it is impossible to make report of the number. And there were heaps of spines, some heaps large, and others less large, and others smaller still than these, and these heaps were many in number. This region in which the spines are scattered upon the ground is of the nature of an entrance from a narrow mountain pass to a great plain, which plain adjoins the plain in Egypt. And the story goes that at the beginning of spring, winged serpents from Arabia fly towards Egypt, and the birds called ibises meet them at the entrance to this country, and do not suffer the serpents to go by, but kill them. On account of this deed it is, say the Arabians, that the ibis has come to be greatly honored by the Egyptians, and the Egyptians also agree that it is for this reason that they honor these birds. The outward form of the ibis is this. It is a deep black all over and has legs like those of a crane and a very curved beak, and in size it is about equal to a rail. This is the appearance of the black kind which fight with the serpents but of those which most crowd round men's feet, for there are two several kinds of ibises, the head is bare, and also the whole of the throat. And it is white in feathering, except the head and neck, and the extremities of the wings and the rump. In all these parts of which I have spoken, it is a deep black while in legs and in the form of the head it resembles the other. As for the serpent, its form is like that of a water snake, and it has wings not feathered, 
but most nearly resembling the wings of the bat. Let so much suffice, as has been said now concerning sacred animals. Of the Egyptians themselves, those who dwell in the part of Egypt which is sown for crops, practice memory more than any other men, and are the most learned in history by far of all those of whom I have had experience. And their manner of life is as follows. For three successive days in each month they purge, hunting after health with emetics and clysters, and they think that all the diseases which exist are produced in men by the food on which they live. For the Egyptians are from other causes, also the most healthy of all men next after the Libyans, in my opinion on account of the seasons, because the seasons do not change. For by the changes of things generally, and especially of the seasons, diseases are most apt to be produced in men. And as to their diet, it is as follows. They eat bread, making loaves of maize, which they call cholestus. And they use habitually a wine made out of barley, for vines they have not in their land. Of their fish, some they dry in the sun, and then eat them without cooking. Others they eat cured in brine. Of birds, they eat quails and ducks, and small birds without cooking, after first curing them. And everything else which they have belonging to the class of birds or fishes, except such as have been set apart by them as sacred, they eat roasted or boiled. In the entertainments of the rich among them, when they have finished eating, a man bears round a wooden figure of a dead body in a coffin, made as like the reality as may be both by painting and carving, and measuring about a cubit or two cubits each way. And this he shows to each of those who are drinking together, saying, When thou lookest upon this, Drink and be merry, for thou shalt be such as this when thou art dead. Thus they do at their carousals. The customs which they practice are derived from their fathers, and they do not acquire others in addition. But besides other customary things among them which are worthy of mention, they have one song that of Linus, the same who is sung of both in Phoenicia and in Cyprus and elsewhere, having, however, a name different according to the various nations. This song agrees exactly with that which the Hellenes sing, calling on the name of Linus, so that besides many other things about which I wonder among these matters which concern Egypt, I wonder especially about this, namely, whence they got the song of Linus. It is evident, however, that they have sung this song from immemorial time, and in the Egyptian tongue, Linus is called Maneros. The Egyptians told me that he was the only son of him who first became king of Egypt and that he died before his time, and was honored with these lamentations by the Egyptians, and that this was their first and only song. In another respect, the Egyptians are in agreement with some of the Hellenes, namely with the Lacedaemonians, but not with the rest. That is to say, the younger of them when they meet the elder, give way and move out of the path, and when their elders approach, they rise out of their seat. In this which follows, however, they are not in agreement with any of the Hellenes. Instead of addressing one another in the roads, they do reverence, 
lowering their hand down to their knee. They wear tunics of linen about their legs with fringes, which they call colossaris. Above these, they have garments of white wool thrown over. Woolen garments, however, are not taken into the temples, nor are they buried with them, for this is not permitted by religion. In these points, they are in agreement with the observances called Orphic and Bacchic, which are really Egyptian, and also with those of the Pythagoreans, for one who takes part in these mysteries is also forbidden by religious rule to be buried in woolen garments. And about this, there is a sacred story told. Besides these things, the Egyptians have found out also to what god each month and each day belongs, and what fortunes a man will meet with who is born on any particular day, and how he will die, and what kind of a man he will be. And these inventions were taken up by those of the Hellenes who occupied themselves about poesy. Portents, too, have been found out by them, more than by all other men besides. For when a portent has happened, they observe and write down the event which comes of it. And if ever afterwards anything resembling this happens, they believe that the event which comes of it will be similar. Their divination is ordered thus. The art is assigned not to any man, but to certain of the gods. For there are in their land oracles of Heracles, of Apollo, of Athena, of Artemis, or Ares, and of Zeus. And moreover, that which they hold most in honor of all, namely the oracle of Leto, which is in the city of Buto. The manner of divination, however, is not established among them, according to the same fashion everywhere, but is different in different places. The art of medicine among them is distributed thus, each physician is a physician of one disease and of no more, and the whole country is full of physicians, for some profess themselves to be physicians of the eyes, others of the head, others of the teeth, others of the affections of the stomach, and others of the more obscure ailments. Their fashions of mourning and of burial are these. Whenever any household has lost a man who is of any regard amongst them, the whole number of women of that house, for with plaster over their heads or even their faces with mud, then leaving the corpse within the house, they go themselves to and fro about the city and beat themselves with their garments bound up by a girdle, and their breasts exposed. And with them go all the women who are related to the dead man. And on the other side the men beat themselves, they too having their garments bound up by a girdle. And when they have done this, they then convey the body to the embalming, in this occupation, certain persons employ themselves regularly and inherit this as a craft. These, whenever a corpse is conveyed to them, show to those who brought it wooden models of corpses made like reality by painting. And the best of the ways of embalming, they say, is that of him whose name I think it impiety to mention when speaking of a matter of such a kind. The second which they show is less good than this, and also less expensive, and the third is the least expensive of all. Having told them about this, they inquire of them in which way they desire the corpse of their friend to be prepared. Then they, after they have agreed for a certain price, 
depart out of the way, and the others being left behind in the buildings, embalm according to the best of these ways thus. First, with the crooked iron tool, they draw out the brain through the nostrils, extracting it partly thus, and partly by pouring in drugs. And after this, with a sharp stone of Ethiopia, they make a cut along the side, and take out the whole contents of the belly. And when they have cleared out the cavity and cleansed it with palm wine, they cleanse it again with spices pounded up. Then they fill the belly with pure myrrh pounded up, and with cassia and other spices except frankincense, and sew it together again. Having so done, they keep it for embalming covered up in natron for seventy days. But for a longer time than this, it is not permitted to embalm it. And when the seventy days are past, they wash the corpse and roll its whole body up in fine linen cut into bands, smearing these beneath with gum, which the Egyptians use generally instead of glue. Then the kinsfolk receive it from them, and have a wooden figure made in the shape of a man. And when they have had this made, they enclose the corpse and having shut it up within, they store it then in a sepulchral chamber, setting it to stand upright against the wall. Thus they deal with the corpses which are prepared in the most costly way. But for those who desire the middle way, and wish to avoid great cost, they prepare the corpse as follows. Having filled their syringes with the oil which is got from cedar wood, with this they forthwith fill the belly of the corpse, and this they do without having either cut it open or taking out the bowels. But they inject the oil by the breech, and having stopped the drench from returning back, they keep it then the appointed number of days for embalming and on the last of the days they let the cedar oil come out from the belly, which they before put in. And it has such power that it brings out with it the bowels and interior organs of the body dissolved, and the natron dissolves the flesh, so that there is left of the corpse only the skin and the bones. When they have done this, they give back the corpse at once in that condition, without working upon it any more. The third kind of embalming, by which are prepared the bodies of those who have less means, is as follows. They cleanse out the belly with a purge, and then keep the body for embalming during the seventy days. And at once after that, they give it back to the bringers to carry away. Whenever anyone, either of the Egyptians themselves or of strangers, is found to have been carried off by a crocodile, or brought to his death by the river itself, the people of any city by which he may have been cast up on land must embalm him, and lay him out in the fairest way they can, and bury him in a sacred burial place. Nor may any of his relations or friends besides touch him, but the priests of the Nile themselves handle the corpse and bury it as that of one who was something more than man. Hellenic usages they will by no means follow, and to speak generally, they follow those of no other men whatever. This rule is observed by most of the Egyptians, but there is a large city named Chemis in the Theban district near Neapolis, and in this city there is a temple of Perseus, the son of Danae, which is of a square shape, and round it grow date palms. 
the gateway of the temple is built of stone and of very great size and at the entrance of it stand two great statues of stone within this enclosure is a temple house and in it stands an image of perseus these people of chemis say that perseus is wont often to appear in their land and often within the temple and that a sandal which has been worn by him is found sometimes being in length two cubits and whenever this appears all egypt prospers this they say and they do in honor of perseus after hellenic fashion thus they hold an athletic contest which includes the whole list of games and they offer in prizes cattle and cloaks and skins and when i inquired why to them alone perseus was wont to appear and wherefore they were separated from all the other egyptians in that they held an athletic contest they said that perseus had been born of their city for danaos and lynceus were men of chemis and had sailed to hellas and from them they traced a descent and came down to perseus and they told me that he had come to egypt for the reason which the hellenes also say namely to bring from libya the gorgon's head and had then visited them also and recognized all his kinsfolk and they said that he had well learnt the name of chemis before he came to egypt since he had heard it from his mother and that they celebrated an athletic contest for him by his own command all these are customs practiced by the egyptians who dwell above the fens and those who are settled in the fenland have the same customs for the most part as the other egyptians both in other matters and also in that they live each with one wife only as do the hellenes but for economy in respect of food they have invented these things besides when the river has become full and the plains have been flooded they grow in the water great numbers of lilies which the egyptians call lotus these they cut with a sickle and dry in the sun and then they pound that which grows in the middle of the lotus and which is like the head of a poppy and they make of it loaves baked with fire the root also of this lotus is edible and has a rather sweet taste it is round in shape and about the size of an apple there are other lilies too in flower resembling roses which also grow in the river and from them the fruit is produced in a separate vessel springing from the root by the side of the plant itself and very nearly resembles a wasp's comb in this there grow edible seeds in great numbers of the size of an olive stone and they are eaten either fresh or dried besides this they pull up from the fens the papyrus which grows every year and the upper parts of it they cut off and turn to other uses but that which is left below for about a cubit in length they eat or sell and those who desire to have the papyrus at its very best bake it in an oven heated red hot and then eat it some two of these people live on fish alone which they dry in the sun after having caught them and taken out the entrails and then when they are dry they use them for food fish which swim in shoals are not much produced in the rivers but are bred in the lakes and they do as follows when there comes upon them the desire to breed 
they swim out in shoals towards the sea, and the males lead the way, shedding forth their milt as they go, while the females coming after and swallowing it up, from it become impregnated. And when they have become full of young in the sea, they swim up back again, each shoal to its own haunts. The same, however, no longer lead the way as before, but the lead comes now to the females, and they, leading the way in shoals, do just as the males did. That is to say, they shed forth their eggs by a few grains at a time, and the males, coming after, swallow them up. Now these grains are fish, and from the grains which survive and are not swallowed, the fish grow which afterwards are bred up. Now those of the fish which are caught as they swim out towards the sea are found to be rubbed on the left side of the head, but those which are caught as they swim up again are rubbed on the right side. This happens to them because as they swim down to the sea, they keep close to the land on the left side of the river, and again as they swim up, they keep to the same side, approaching and touching the bank as much as they can, for fear doubtless of straying from their course by reason of the stream. When the Nile begins to swell, the hollow places of the land and the depressions by the side of the river first begin to fill as the water soaks through them from the river. And so soon as they become full of water, at once they are all filled with little fishes. And whence these are in all likelihood produced, I think that I perceive. In the preceding year, when the Nile goes down, the fish first lay eggs in the mud and then retire with the last of the retreating waters. And when the time comes round again, and the water once more comes over the land, from these eggs forthwith are produced the fishes of which I speak. Thus it is as regards the fish. And for anointing, those of the Egyptians who dwell in the fens use oil from the castor berry, which oil the Egyptians call kiki, and thus they do. They sow along the banks of the rivers and pools these plants, which in a wild form grow of themselves in the land of the Hellenes. These are sown in Egypt and produce berries in great quantity, but of an evil smell. And when they have gathered these, some cut them up and press the oil from them. Others again roast them first, and then boil them down and collect that which runs away from them. The oil is fat and not less suitable for burning than olive oil but it gives forth a disagreeable smell. Against the gnats, which are very abundant, they have contrived as follows. Those who dwell above the fenland are helped by the towers, to which they ascend when they go to rest. For the gnats, by reason of the winds, are not able to fly up high. But those who dwell in the Fenland have contrived another way instead of the towers, and this is it. Every man of them has got a casting net, with which by day he catches fish. But in the night he uses it for this purpose. That is to say, he puts the casting net round about the bed in which he sleeps and then creeps in under it and goes to sleep. And the gnats, if he sleeps rolled up in a garment or a linen sheet, bite through these, but through the net they do not even attempt a bite. Their boats with which they carry cargoes are made of the thorny acacia, 
of which the form is very like that of the Carinian lotus, and that which exudes from it is gum. From this tree they cut pieces of wood about two cubits in length, and arrange them like bricks, fastening the boat together by running a great number of long bolts through the two cubits pieces. And when they have thus fastened the boat together, they lay cross pieces over the top, using no ribs for the sides. And within, they caulk the seams with papyrus. They make one steering oar for it, which is passed through the bottom of the boat, and they have a mast of acacia and sails of papyrus. These boats cannot sail up the river unless there be a very fresh wind blowing, but are towed from the shore. Downstream, however, they travel as follows. They have a door-shaped crate made of tamarisk wood and reed mats sewn together, and also a stone of about two talents weight bored with a hole and of these the boatman lets the crate float on in front of the boat, fastened with a rope, and the stone drags behind by another rope. The crate then, as the force of the stream presses upon it, goes on swiftly and draws on the baris, for so these boats are called, while the stone dragging after it behind and sunk deep in the water keeps its course straight. These boats they have in great numbers, and some of them carry many thousands of talents burden. When the Nile comes over the land, the cities alone are seen rising above the water, resembling more nearly than anything else the islands in the Aegean Sea, for the rest of Egypt becomes a sea, and the cities alone rise above water. Accordingly, whenever this happens, they pass by water not now by the channels of the river, but over the midst of the plain. For example, as one sails up from Nocratus to Memphis, the passage is then close by the pyramids, whereas the usual passage is not the same even here but goes by the point of the delta and the city of Kirkasaurus. While if you sail over the plain to Nocratus from the sea and from Canobus, you will go by Anthilla and the city called after Arcander. Of these, Anthilla is a city of note and is especially assigned to the wife of him who reigns over Egypt to supply her with sandals. This is the case since the time when Egypt came to be under the Persians. The other city seems to me to have its name from Arcander, the son-in-law of Danaeus, who was the son of Pythias, the son of Achaios, for it is called the city of Arcander. There might indeed be another Arcander, but in any case, the name is not Egyptian. Hitherto, my own observation and judgment and inquiry are the vouchers for that which I have said. But from this point onwards, I am about to tell the history of Egypt according to that which I have heard, to which will be added also something of that which I myself have seen of Min, who first became king of Egypt, the priest said that on the one hand he banked off the site of Memphis from the river, for the whole stream of the river used to flow along by the sandy mountain range on the side of Libya. But Min formed by embankments that bend of the river, which lies to the south, about a hundred furlongs above Memphis and thus he dried up the old stream and conducted the river so that it flowed in the middle between the mountains. 
And even now, this bend of the Nile is by the Persians kept under very careful watch, that it may flow in the channel to which it is confined, and the bank is repaired every year. For if the river should break through and overflow in this direction, Memphis would be in danger of being overwhelmed by flood. When this Min, who first became king, had made into dry land the part which was dammed off, on the one hand, I say, he founded in it that city which is now called Memphis. For Memphis, too, is in the narrow part of Egypt. And outside the city he dug round it on the north and west, a lake communicating with the river, for the side towards the east is barred by the Nile itself. Then secondly, he established in the city the temple of Hephaestus, a great work and most worthy of mention. After this man, the priests enumerated to me from a papyrus roll the names of other kings, three hundred and thirty in number. And in all these generations of men, eighteen were Ethiopians. One was a woman, a native Egyptian, and the rest were men and of Egyptian race. And the name of the woman who reigned was the same as that of the Babylonian queen, namely Nitocris. Of her, they said, that desiring to take vengeance for her brother, whom the Egyptians had slain when he was their king, and then, after having slain him, had given his kingdom to her, desiring, I say, to take vengeance for him, she destroyed by craft many of the Egyptians. For she caused to be constructed a very large chamber underground, and making as though she would hansel it, but in her mind devising other things, she invited those of the Egyptians whom she knew to have had most part in the murder, and gave a great banquet. Then, while they were feasting, she let in the river upon them by a secret conduit of large size. Of her they told no more than this, except that, when this had been accomplished, she threw herself into a room full of embers, in order that she might escape vengeance. As for the other kings, they could tell me of no great works which had been produced by them, and they said that they had no renown except only the last of them, Moiris. He, they said, produced as a memorial of himself, the gateway of the temple of Hephaestus, which is turned towards the north wind, and dug a lake, about which I shall set forth afterwards how many furlongs of circuit it has, and in it built pyramids of the size which I shall mention at the same time when I speak of the lake itself. He, they said, produced these works, but of the rest none produced any. Therefore, passing these by, I will make mention of the king who came after these, whose name is Sisostris. He, the priest said, first of all set out with ships of war from the Arabian Gulf, and subdued those who dwelt by the shores of the Erythrean Sea, until, as he sailed, he came to a sea which could no further be navigated by reason of shoals. Then secondly, after he had returned to Egypt, according to the report of the priests, he took a great army and marched over the continent, subduing every nation which stood in his way. And those of them who he found valiant and fighting desperately for their freedom in their lands he set up pillars which told by inscriptions his own name and the name of his country and how he had subdued them by his power. But as to those of whose cities he obtained possession without fighting or with ease, 
On their pillars he inscribed words after the same tenor, as he did for the nations which had shown themselves courageous, and in addition he drew upon them the hidden parts of a woman, desiring to signify by this that the people were cowards and effeminate. Thus doing, he traversed the continent, until at last he passed over to Europe from Asia, and subdued the Scythians and also the Thracians. These, I am of opinion, were the furthest people to which the Egyptian army came, for in their country the pillars are found to have been set up, but in the land beyond this they are no longer found. From this point he turned and began to go back, and when he came to the river Phasis, what happened then I cannot say for certain, whether the king Sisostris himself divided off a certain portion of his army and left the men there as settlers in the land, or whether some of his soldiers were wearied by his distant marches and remained by the river Phasis. For the people of Colchis are evidently Egyptian, and this I perceived for myself before I heard it from others. So when I had come to consider the matter, I asked them both, and the Colchians had remembrance of the Egyptians more than the Egyptians of the Colchians. But the Egyptians said they believed that the Colchians were a portion of the army of Sesostris. That this was so, I conjectured myself, not only because they are dark-skinned and have curly hair, this of itself amounts to nothing, for there are other races which are so, but also still more because the Colchians, Egyptians and Ethiopians alone, of all the races of men, have practiced circumcision from the first. The Phoenicians and the Syrians who dwell in Palestine confess themselves that they have learnt it from the Egyptians, and the Syrians about the river Thermodon and the river Parthenios, and the Macronians, who are their neighbors, say that they have learnt it lately from the Colchians. These are the only races of men who practice circumcision, and these evidently practice it in the same manner as the Egyptians. Of the Egyptians themselves, however, and the Ethiopians, I am not able to say which learnt from the other, for undoubtedly it is a most ancient custom. But that the other nations learnt it from the Egyptians, this, among others, is to me a strong proof namely that those of the Phoenicians who have trade with Hellas cease to follow the example of the Egyptians in this matter, and do not circumcise their children. Now, let me tell you another thing about the Colchians, to show how they resemble the Egyptians. They alone work flax in the same fashion as the Egyptians, and the two nations are like one another, in their whole manner of living, and also in their language. Now the linen of Colchis is called by the Hellenes sardonic, whereas that from Egypt is called Egyptian. The pillars which Sesostris, king of Egypt, set up in the various countries are for the most part no longer to be seen extant. But in Syria, Palestine, I myself saw them existing with the inscription upon them, which I have mentioned, and the emblem. Moreover, in Ionia, there are two figures of this man carved upon rocks, one on the road by which one goes from the land of Ephesus to Phocaea, and the other on the road from Sardis to Smyrna. In either place there is a figure of a man cut in the rock, of four cubits and a span in height, holding in his right hand a spear, and in his left a bow and arrows. And the other equipment which he has is similar to this, for it is both Egyptian and Ethiopian. 
and from the one shoulder to the other across the breast runs an inscription carved in sacred Egyptian characters saying thus, This land with my shoulders I won for myself. But who he is and from whence, he does not declare in these places, though in other places he had declared this. Some of those who have seen these carvings conjecture that the figure is that of Memnon, but herein they are very far from the truth. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from an account of Egypt by the great historian Herodotus, although I suppose we can use the word historian with some very large quote marks around it. If you'd like to read this classic work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>